everybody. Thank you. I feel a bit daunted following Terry and um, John this morning. But anyway, I've been trying to get here for years to give a talk and Anne finally gave me a Guernsey this year, so I thank her for that because I'm close to retiring, so it was a chance. Um, when I refer to the petitions at different times, you actually have these in your bags and they have the BRAC uh, website address on the back, which is the three Ws, brac.vic.gov.au. But I, when I refer to the petitions, that's what I'm actually speaking about. Um, I've come at it from a bit of a different angle to the other speakers we've heard so far today. The BRAC uh, petitions and maps and plans collection, sorry, is fairly extensive. It takes up 52 archival boxes and... Sorry, I'm just going to play with this at the same time. My first image should come up. Is that right? Nope, it's gone too far. Sorry. Having the same trouble as everyone else. I have even more IT trouble than Charlie Ferruja. Um, goes back to years, Kostetners used to blow up on me, photocopiers hate me. Anyway, I'll get there. Um, the Maps and Plans collection take up 52 archival boxes and the bundles that are too big, like about that thick, they just sit there in bundles. We're really fortunate that volunteers years ago before BRAC came into existence in 2008 indexed them. So what, what I did was I, I had a bit of fun. I thought, look, I can't discuss all 52 boxes with you, but I, I wanted you to understand how rich the collection was and that's partly why I started with that title as a hook to get you thinking what I was going to do. From cattle yards to war workers' um, homes. And the collection is as varied as that. It's an A to Z. And it's all the major pieces of infrastructure that you can think of that you can see in Bendigo today, the former city of Sandhurst, now known as Bendigo. And from my point of view, it makes it the most eclectic of the series that we hold at BRAC. We have an enormous collection of local government records, of which this is one, and we have court records and we're about to move into acquiring community records. So I, I do use the word eclectic in its true sense of the word if you look it up in the dictionary. So we're talking roads and bridges, plans, drainage, channels, municipal baths, cattle yards, the old showgrounds, as opposed to the present day showgrounds, uh, the tramway system that has existed in Bendigo since 1890, the Bendigo Creek, the botanical gardens, Lake Waruna, the ordnance factory, you name it, they're there. And from that point of view, it's just the most wonderful collection. But I had to think of the angle of you family historians sitting here, and I wanted to try and do you a service. So I've tried to pick five examples of what I would call um, social or cultural infrastructure that your great-grandparents, if they had lived in Bendigo and District, would have seen. Um, so, as in a particular statue that still sits prominently in Pall Mall is one of my examples, a home that still exists on the corner of Lily and Rowan Street, our famous municipal bars, which is now a beautiful, you know, hydroelectric aquatic centre, but um, back then it certainly <laughs> wasn't, as you'll find out shortly. And, and what I've tried to do is use each plan as a springboard, if you like, to dovetail back into the rest of the BRAC collection because I thought it was a way of, of doing its service to the whole organisation and all the records that I look after. So off we go. Um, the first one that I have is the plan for street lighting in the city. It is undated but I have put there for you circa 1895. It comes from bundle one as opposed to bundle 52. And the um, series is just known as Bendigo Council Plans. We do have VPRS numbers for our collection, but not for every series. And this is one that doesn't have one yet. But it doesn't matter. You just ring me or send me an email and say, Michelle, I want to come and look at this bundle or I want to look at the index to the Maps and Plans collection, and that's no problem. But you can't order them online as such, unlike some of our other series. So I'm very confident that this plan is about 1895 because the key that appears lower down that I had to chop off refers to the dots representing gas, kerosene and electric lighting. Electric lighting was first proposed in the early 1890s for the street lighting conversion um, and it appears in a number of reports to council. So that's why I've plumped for the date that I have. I haven't just pulled it out of thin air. The transition from gas and kerosene lighting to electric was time consuming and it was also expensive. So it's not surprising that the evolution took a while. I also want you to think of your poor great grandparents living in 19th century Sandhurst. It would have been a very dangerous place to live, is what I've said to people on numerous occasions. If you walk 
walked or rode at night in particular, you literally took your life into your hands. You had mining work occurring, you had footpaths that had not been formed yet, roads that had not been formed, people mining under sections of roads and footpaths. We've got an actual um, volume that deals with that. So for you to negotiate that minor street lighting must have been a nightmare. And it's therefore not surprising that within those 628 petitions that Anne mentioned, just in the years 1870 to 1873, 14 of them were specific requests for a street lamp to be constructed at the intersection of two particular streets. And these are available on the BRAC website, as I said to you. Reports to council tell us the evolution of our street lighting system. So, in 1870, there were only 163 lamps in the city. 102 were gas and 61 were kerosene driven. The times for lighting and extinguishing these were defined in a report sent to council. And this is the quote, this is not my words. When no moon all night and when moon before rising and after setting. If you can work that out, let me know, will you please? One irate shopkeeper in 1882, whose shop had been burgled, argued with the council that if the street lamp near his shop had not been extinguished under those regulations, he would not have been burgled. By 1881, T.J. Connolly Senior, our, our um, uh, father of one of our most prominent Bendigonians and, and a very busy local ironmonger, suggested to the council that they may wish to replace the council's kerosene lamps with the new gasoline lamps. And what he, what he wanted, wonder what his main stock was in his shop and he wanted the contract, and he got it, by the way. It was nearly four years later before Knight, the then city surveyor, reported that he had experimented to see if gas-lit lamps were better than kerosene lamps. From the mid-1880s, different companies in Melbourne and even one in New Zealand asked the council to consider converting the city's street lamps to electricity. Probably in response to these overtures, a local law firm, Crabb, Cohen and Kirby, wrote on behalf of the then Bendigo Gas Company, warning the council against granting exclusive rights to one company, quote, for the erection in the public streets of the city of Poles for electric lighting purposes. Council sought its own legal advice from none other than their most prominent barrister, Dr John Quick, who was one of the 50 gentlemen who wrote our Australian constitution that's been so topical last week. And Quick analysed the act governing the Bendigo Gas Company and he concluded that the company did not have a monopoly over the supply of gas as opposed to local electric lighting. All these quotes that I give you, by the way, are from our 19th century correspondence collection. That's where the petitions sit. Um, and I should have, um, oh, well, it doesn't pertain to the plans, but if you're wanting to follow that up, it's VPRS 16936, and it's a most wonderful collection, and I am referring to those quite often. There was also the issue of damage to street lighting. A later a, um, city surveyor, Minto, reported that the street lamps were being damaged in what he termed this wanton destruction of public property and two 1895 reports specifically itemised where the broken street lamps uh, that were being uh, such a concern were physically located. My second plan, this is one of my favourites, and I just want, if anybody's got the surname Kingsley in the family, please, will you come and see me? Because this house is still standing, corner of Lily and Rowan Street, and I would love the present day owners to come, because wouldn't that be a gem to make a digital copy of and have hanging in your front foyer? Um, it's one of the house plans that was in colour, as opposed to some of the black and white ones that were submitted for, for permits to do extensions, which is what we're talking about here. And this comes, in this case, from Bundle 5, but both Bundles 5 and 12 contain a number of these, and they, they span all sorts of periods. But this one I love because of the colour. It's... Um, those plans that were there are specifically to build houses from scratch, uh, to alter, to make additions to both local houses and businesses. 
And for the present day owner, these plans will be a gold mine of information because if you have a look up in the top right hand corner, depending on your site, the permit number is there. So the council already had that administrative structure in place. The um, owner at the time is stated, Mrs. Kingsley. The original horse, the original four plan is just delightful. You can see every room has been labelled. So you've got the bedrooms, you've got the front and back verandas, you've got a dining and drawing room, you've got the primitive kitchen out the back, which is where I think the work was occurring, you know, to bring that in. And each of the four fireplaces in the body and the one in the kitchen are obviously visible. Um, I wanted to just know a little bit um, about Mrs Kingsley. So what I did was I cross-referenced to the faithful Bendigo rate books. I love rate books, by the way. Anyone who tells you that a rate book is boring, I'm sorry, they don't know what they're talking about. They're just the most wonderful gems of information. Charlie sort of gave you a little bit of a hint. But I look after eight sets, and each of them have got their own little quirks. And, and the Bendigo ones I'm particularly attached to because they span, in, in that case, 102 years. They're in fairly good condition. And they give you the details, not just about the owners of properties but the occupiers and if you had a poor great-great-grandparent don't worry because they'll appear in the occupier column and there's no shame in that <laughs> because you're wanting to find them aren't you regardless of where they are and that tells you something that at the time that they're appearing in the occupier column you can always live in hope that they progress financially and move into the owner column. So in this case Anne Kingsley does appear she was the owner but she wasn't living in this house. She's made a decision to do these renovations but not for her own purposes. She's renting it out to a local gentleman who was a blacksmith from memory, and her own occupation was H duties, home duties. Um, the land and house had a net annual value of £12 in the 1915 rate book. That's fine, that's good for that time period. But I thought I'd look in the following year, because I'm assuming that she got the OK for this, let's see what the rate book tells me, and lo and behold, the net annual value is £18. That's fairly concrete proof to me that that work that you're looking at now on that plan was approved and was executed. Um, the present day plan of the house happened to appear on the local real estate um, website just a few months ago because the house was resold and the interior plan of the house, the layout, appears on that website and I, I didn't take an image for you but I can assure you that the layout has not changed that much in the 100 years. The owners in between might like to think they but all they did was tinker from what I can see. Any later permits for houses or building constructions, alterations, etc., in Bendigo, I'm talking about not the outlying areas, sorry, those councils don't seem to have created these, or they've gone lost in the sands of time. But we have five volumes of what we call Bendigo Council building registers. They span 1924 to 1969. And here you get the owner's name, the builder's name, the property's location, as well as what work was being done. So again, if if you believe a great-grandparent was a property owner, they're a really nice um, source of information relative to what they were doing with a particular property at a particular time. My third story, and this is my, isn't it an unusual block of land? Uh, any of you ever been to Bendigo? This is still what the block looks like. It is, this is at the far end of Pall Mall. Do you know this conservatory gardens? The conservatory gardens are just to the north of that, literally across the road, and the law courts are back a bit further and the post office and whatever. So it's, it's north, the northern end of Pall Mall as you're heading to Echuca, if you like, for people who haven't travelled there. The block has not changed. It still sits like that in the middle of the road. What has changed, the only thing that probably saved its bacon was the fact that I found this image and when the council officer was asked to write a report and she couldn't tell me why, the upshot was the council were proposing to put their new taxi rank somewhere. So have a guess where it is. Sorry, because I conclusively proved how historically valuable the statue that sits on the very corner was and that we had the plans and we had the notations and we have another surviving series that complemented it and the staff member agreed with me and wrote a really glowing report. They couldn't put it anywhere else and move the statue, they, so they, they put it there. But the statue still overrides it anyway, thank goodness, but it's this really weird mod structure for anyone who's seen it and these toilets and... But anyway, that's by the by, ladies and gentlemen. Um, 
It's known affectionately as the Gold Jubilee Statue, and Jubilee, by implication, was, it came out of funds raised from an exhibition that was known as the Victorian Gold Jubilee Exhibition, but it was held in Bendigo, not in Melbourne or whatever, like you might expect. And it was to mark the 50th anniversary of gold having been discovered in, um, in Golden Square and the beginning of our major gold rush. So what we've got, we know that exhibition took place from the 13th of November to, of 1901 to the 14th of May 1902. The plan tells us that there was this idea that they're going to create this gold statue. But the rest of the story comes out of the two beautiful volumes that we've got. One is the Victorian Gold Jubilee Exhibition Entries volume. It's about that big. And it's a beautiful green leather bound cover. And then it's got a little accompanying cash book. And both of them tell the rest of the story that complements this plan. So in the entries book, it itemises everything that was displayed in this exhibition. And they, they set it up as courts. They used our beautiful town hall and then a neighbouring substantial annex, temporary annex, was attached to it in order to hold the amount of exhibitions. So every single piece that was submitted, and we're talking bohemian crystal uh, valued at £600 that was brought down specially from Sydney, through to someone like Taylor Horsfeld, one of our local um, iron founders. His £850 valued air compressor and rock borer were on display, for those of you who are into that. But if you're a great nephew of Taylor Horsfeld, you might get really excited by that entry. I hope so. Um, the different um, uh, courts had different names. So you went through the machinery court, the agricultural court, the naval one, the art one. But my personal favourite for the ladies in the audience, there was a women's court, is how they referred to it. And that had cotton and haberdashery on display, ladies from Manchester in England and Staffordshire, corsets and embroideries, if you were that way inclined, from Paris, and of course parasols and umbrellas to float your boat when you got excited as you walked through. The large cash book demonstrated the final part of the uh, the puzzle, the jigsaw, behind the statue. The total profits from the exhibition came to £1,153. The sculptor that they chose to create the statue that sits on this end corner where it was proposed is a gentleman called Charles Richardson. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Oh, I didn't know him at all. But he was a young up-and-coming sculptor at that time. If you Google Australian Dictionary of Biography, there's a wonderful passage about him, and it says that one of his earliest, most prominent pieces of work was the gold statue in Bendigo. And there's a lovely photo. I said thank you to one of the State Library staff sitting near me in their collection, and it's Richardson sculpting away on it. It's a huge statue, like he's standing there full size, and the statue's nearly twice as tall as him. It's a woman and she's sort of draped, sort of Grecian style almost, and she's holding a gold pan from memory. And, and it really is quite attractive if you ever get a chance. Maybe, maybe Google map it like some of the others were doing. I didn't think that far. But the cash book is great because it showed that Richardson was paid in instalments. And that, as I said, the instalments in total, he received the princely sum of £1,160 to create this statue. Um, and the profits came from day-to-day -day gates admission, but also people were buying season's tickets. It's like going off to the footy, isn't it? Collingwood supporters like my husband, they'd be absolutely thrilled about that. Um, and, I've got, and the names of each person or the family is listed. So again, if you know your relatives were living in Bendigo and District because there are people from the outlying areas bothered to come in too, you may find their names in the cash book as a part, or as I said, in the entries that they've submitted something. So there's lots of angles to take with our records for family historians using these as a beginning. The fourth one is, is one of my loves. My boss is preparing an exhibition at the moment on the history of public um, baths, swimming pools, etc. with the summer coming up. And she had this image and said, why don't you use this one? It's a ripper. So I'll see if I can manage. And the little red dot does the red dot. Is that right? OK. So it should be up in, let me think, in the middle section. Can you see the writing? It says ladies only. <laughs> Bottom left, it says men only. But my personal favourite over here, 
the paddling paddock for young children, which was a, you know, extreme necessity in 1913. It was pretty damn hot in downtown Bendigo, any of you who have visited us in the summer. Um, this plan has to be dated 1911, 1912, because the pool was officially opened, sorry, the baths, municipal baths were officially opened in February 1913. Now, I found a description, again, some of the others were playing this morning with, um, I think John did it um, at Trove, and I do it too. This is from the Bendigo Independent, courtesy of my favourite local volunteer, thank you Sandy, who's listening. In 1917, these baths were described as <clears throat> the municipal baths are, it is agreed, the finest open baths in Australia. Yeah. And they should be a source of interest to the returning prodigal. Prodigal, I had to think about that and I've decided it's returning disabled soldiers is what they're talking about. But I'm going to say, ladies and gentlemen, incredibly high praise for what was a series of ex dams with a a mud bottom. I just, I just find that amazing. I think that's, that's just stretching beyond the realms of imagination, that one. Now, nearby Golden Square were really... Anne, am I allowed to swear? Just a little word? Not the rude word, just the little one. Um, they were shitty because their outdoor baths, they had been promised them since the 1880s. We've got two substantial petitions where they are saying, what are you doing? And there was a forerunner to this pool, I've discovered, because in the 1895 petition, they say, you have spent £4,000 on baths in the upper reserve before complying with Golden Square requisites, which have been promised for the last 12 years, and £600 placed on the council estimates for same. Anyone who tells you, ladies and gentlemen, that history does not repeat itself, <laughs> just come and visit me, because I tell you, and the council doesn't pay my salary, by the way, so I can say that publicly, it's all right. So this shows us, this document shows us that there were 19th century forerunner outdoor baths. Upper Reserve, by the way, is the old name, affectionately, for what is now Roslyn Park, and that's where this is located, okay? So that, that was sort of my double clue, if you like. Other suburbs swimming facilities followed much later. By 1958, these municipal baths were looking a bit tired, people maybe got sick of getting mud between their toes, I'm not quite sure, and also there was the big occasion of the 56 Olympics in Melbourne. So £17,000, a lot of money back then, was raised by public subscription, and we know this from our surviving incoming 20th century correspondence collection, which also doesn't have a VPRS number, sorry. So again, it's a Michelle phone call, and can I use such and such a... Um, a file, Michelle, from the 20th century correspondence, or have you got such and such a file, Michelle? And in most cases we have, because it's an A to Z as well. So the pool's construction um, occurred, it was opened in the summer of 58 as well, and today on this same site, next door to the one with the mud bottom, is what's now our state-of-the-art, fantastic filtered water aquatic centre with the um, sunshades over the top and the kittywinkle pool and three others and, and everything is beautiful. So time has moved along as is my time moving along. I'm waiting for Anne to wave at me. Am I doing all right, Anne? The Bendigo Creek. Now, look, people make really derogatory comments about our creek, and I get a bit offended, because really, and I'm including locals, I, I, it, um, it runs through Roslyn Park, and I walk through the park to go to work, and Bendigo Senior's located in the park. And the number of teenagers I see walking along, holding their noses, saying, oh, God, it stinks again today. Well, I'm sorry, that's what happens when there's a build-up of sulphur from the old mines, still under our RSL hall, and there's a pipe going straight out into the creek, let alone all the other muck that's coming from further south. So our creek's been a bit maligned, in my opinion. It's had a most unusual, fascinating history, but really it was our lifeline in 1851. The town wasn't there, put there by accident. They maybe could have picked a more substantial um, water supply because it caused us problems for years until the Colliban system came online. But it really was the most important part of our infrastructure, as well as its little cousin, which even locals, I say to them, oh, you do realise we've got two creeks? Oh, do we, Michelle? Where's the other one? What's it called? Uh, the Back Creek? 
uh, where's the back creek? And I have these wonderful round conversations with people. The two creeks merge together in the centre of the city. But uh, Bendigo Creek starts some kilometres to the south of Bendigo and it goes right through the former Shire of Huntley to the north of Bendigo, heading up to Echuca. And I'm not quite sure where it, where, it, um, where it finishes, so if anybody knows that, maybe Charles can help me. So this is an image of the section of the creek, I think about circa 1872, and I'll show you why. This is what Pall Mall looked like in February 1871. <laughs> and keep in mind that that balcony is the first Shamrock Hotel. The one you see today in Bendigo is the third one on that side. That photographer was standing on the balcony looking towards the present day main office of Bendigo Bank, the fountain, heading, heading that way. That's Roslyn Park over on the right enormous amounts of water. And February is an unusual time for flooding, but that's when we copped it. Because the creek at that time ran closer to Pall Mall. It was after this that the council had to spend enormous amounts of money for some years rerouting it. Because, imagine if you were a shopkeeper on that side, would you not go ballistic? And they did, and we've got the surviving letters saying, what the hell are you doing? Please sort out our problems, because our sellers and all our stock are being flooded. So the council went to an enormous amount of trouble, but it was the beginning of their, um, of their attempts to, to corral a, a geographical feature, if you like. So this, um, I'll go back to that other one. The map that I have for you is a section at the Golden Square end of the city, which is uh, the suburb you go through before you get into town. Regular reports during the 1880s and 1890s, again in the Inwards Correspondence Collection next to the peti petitions, stipulated which sections of the creek were being worked on. But a bit like Terry was just speaking to us and saying, you know, this sort of um, shenanigans go on with acquisition of property. Well, the stories that the creek could tell would, would fill a book, but I'll just give you a couple of examples. The structural work was regularly undertaken. Bluestone tended to be used in the centre of the city for what they called walling the creek. So it's physically um, getting control of the sides of the creek. And then in later reports, it's described as sheeting. Uh, the Golden Square Inn today has a lot of timber work. So I think possibly the bluestone was removed or it was cheaper that as you got a bit away from the city, you swapped over and poor old Golden Square, as you know, gets a bit of a hard time anyway. So it's all right, you know, it doesn't matter, it's only Golden Square. Um, they were regularly applying for uh, government grants and you can see the correspondence backwards and forwards between state government and the council. Um, the other thing that's going on is in unsavoury aspects of the creek's history. The Public Health Department in Melbourne had to give the council a wrap over the knuckles in 1891 because night soil was being deposited in the creek. So, you know, it's way pre our sewage system, but, you know, it's a little bit unsavoury, isn't it? Poor Mr Delaney, a resident in 1891, was nearly screaming at the council in his letter, saying the underground sewer that ran from his front door to the creek was uncovered, and these are his words, not mine, the smell arising therefrom can better be imagined than described. And, and his next bit was, and there's summer coming again, because it was November 91. Mining in the creek was regularly applied for, which is a surprise to a lot of people, and the person applying their name appears. Now, I hate to tell you this, but 19th century Bendigo was racist, ladies and gentlemen, I suppose it was the same as most places around the world at that time. Anglo-Saxon people who might applied to mine in the creek, as in to physically sluice it, use a pan, cradling, they are all the words referred to, they had no trouble. They just put their letter in and they got a yay or a nay. But two Chinese gentlemen by the names of Ah Long and Quin Ak, if you've got them in their family, you can come and visit me. They had an accompanying letter from the most prominent local Chinese gentleman, a citizen, James Lamsey, who trained as a herbalist and a doctor in China, I believe. And he wrote as a, like a guarantor that they would, quote, not injure the creek or its walls. But that was never an issue for an Anglo-Saxon applicant, and I find that a bit disturbing. The sludge byproduct is the last part of the story. It went on and on. We had sludge conferences. We had disputes. Shire of Huntley were basically going nuts because they're at the most northern end of the creek and mining was still so prominent, the 1890s and well into the 20th century. Where was the sludge going? From the southern end of the creek all the way through and landing in Shire of Huntley. So there's regular letters from them that they were obviously annoyed. 
In conclusion, everybody, family historians, you do a wonderful job, but don't forget to put the flesh on the bones, is what I think Richard Broom said many years ago. And don't overlook the stories that are there in things like the plan collection, because they'll help flesh out your family story even more. These were the buildings and the infrastructure that your relatives saw when they went walking on a Sunday or on their way to work. So, thank you. Thank you.